Hope we are all doing well. We thank good, the good Lord for our lives, yeah. I mean, I'm very happy to be here once again. It's been a while. I, I've been laughing since I came, I mean. Um, a lot of new faces, a lot of old faces. And I'm very glad to be here today. And most importantly, to discuss the word of God with you. And I'll thank the leadership also for giving me this opportunity to lead you in this discussion. Today, we are going to look at something very important in our Christian journey. I believe that being here is a privilege for all of us. And we all have the hope that one day we will get to the Savior. So regardless of um, the storms or whatever, we just want to push through and get to where we want to get to. We want to get to where we want to get to. I mean, the price is very important. So we don't want to just run. We don't want to just fight. We want to fight and get there. Um, today, we are starting our Friends Week today. From today to next week, Sunday, God willing. And it's a privilege for us as we do each and every semester to preach to our friends, our loved ones, family, enemies, whoever we see around. I mean, the gospel is for everybody. Christ came to die for everybody that all of us may be saved. So the gospel is for everybody. We go out there to preach to whoever we see so that by God's grace, they will join us here to worship God in spirit and in truth. I remember in 2022, I stood here, I mean, the same um, period, I mean, the same occasion, yes, and we talked about love the Church of Christ. Um, it's one important message that um, we should um, understand and live with. It's very important in the sense that if you don't understand the Church of Christ, you can't love it. And it's actually in all our relationships here on earth. If you don't understand someone, it is very difficult for you to love the person. I'm, I'm not lying, right? Yes. If you don't understand me, there's no way you can love me because um, if I do something, you will not understand. And there's no way that you can have that affection for me if you don't understand me. So it is the same thing. It's rather sometimes unfortunate that for many of us, probably because we are born into the church, so um, we don't really consider some of the, um, the facts about the Church of Christ. Talking of its identity, what she stands for, what she does, and where she is sending us to. Usually we find ourselves in the church and sometimes we forget these important principles. But when we understand it well enough, we are able to love it, we are able to fight for it, and we are able to tell people about it. But if you don't understand it, then it becomes a problem. Today I'm not going to talk about anything different. We are going to talk about something closer to that. And it is very important for us to note. I thank my Bible reader for um, helping me with um, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12. And I want to talk to us today about justify your inclusion. Justify your inclusion. So if you are writing, you can just write that down. I mean, justify your inclusion. Um, I went to university practice. I know Albert also was there. And before you get to Form 3, you have to write an exam to justify why you have to be in Form 3 to write the WASI in the name of the school. So you have to justify your inclusion. Today, I want us to, yes, I mean, you have to. And some people don't get the opportunity, so they have to sit back, write again, then they get from three. Today, I want us to take it in the spiritual um, aspect, not in the exam, but we should justify our inclusion as being Christians. It is very important for us to understand that and to justify ourselves. But how would we justify our inclusion as Christians? That is the main question that we ought to answer. You see, in our Christian journey, there are three important things that help us to progress or to grow. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you read and Paul tells us that it is love, faith, and hope. If you are a Christian and you don't love, you can't love, there is no way you can get to where the Father is. If you are a Christian, then your faith it's shaking, it's weak. There's no way you can get to where the Father is. If you don't have hope, you can't get to where the Father is. So these three main things are components that help us to get to the Father. If you don't have them, it's like 
a daily thing that we need to encourage ourselves with so that we can get to the Father. Without these three, it is very, like, impo- it's so impossible because the, our faith that we have in God is going to help us to love God. So the love and the hope that we, we have, like, it all dangles on faith. So without faith, it becomes impossible, like, impossible, I know it's difficult. It becomes impossible for someone to love God. Without faith, it is impossible for someone to have hope in Christ. Some, something might happen to you, I don't know. You see, in our spiritual world, in quotes out there, do some go home, sorry, no. It is because of faith, that is why they are lost. Because they believe that having faith is just like saying that I have faith that God will do this, God will do that. No. Having faith is basically believing the Bible as our evidence that God will do something. We understand the message of the Bible. That is basically about having faith. So if you don't understand the truth that we have in the Bible, it is very difficult for you to love God. If you don't understand the truth that we have in the Bible, it is very difficult for us to hope that one day you get there. Because for some people, Paul said in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you read verse 19, he said, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, then we are amongst men the most pitiable. Because it's possible that someone might be poor and die as a Christian, and a person might inherit the kingdom of God. But how would you understand this if you don't have faith? How would you love God enough to understand that there is hope for you, not on this earth, but up there. So faith has become something, the basic foundation to our Christian living. Without it, it is impossible for you to please the Father. And that is why people go about, when you see people out there professing that they have a spiritual relationship with Christ, it's so impossible. Because our spirituality as Christians dangles on faith. You see, in Christianity, we have religiosity and Spirituality, And that is what Paul discusses in Romans chapter 10. When he says that, uh, my heart desire for Israel is that they all may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have the zeal. In other words, I see that they are religious, but their religiosity is not according to knowledge. They are religious, fine. They have the zeal for God, but they are not spiritual. So spirituality has got to do with you understanding what God had said and living by it. Now, this Israelite that Paul was talking about, these people, they knew God, yes. But they were not worshipping God according to his commands. They were ignorant of the things of God. So they weren't spiritual. And that was what Paul was talking about. They had a zeal, but they are not spiritual. So if someone is deprived of the doctrine of Christ, someone is deprived of the truth, that person doesn't have any relationship with God. So those people that we see out there, the denominationalists, they profess to be Christians. They are religious. They have the zeal for God. But they are being deprived of the truth of Christ. And they can't inherit the kingdom. And that is why in 2 John says that if you say that you have God and you don't abide in the doctrine, you are deceiving yourself because you can't have Christ. But if you have it, you have the Father and the Son. So when you are deprived of the truth, you can't have any relationship with Christ. And that is how serious it is. And that is why it is very important for us to have faith in Christ, to believe the truth that we have here. If our only hope in Christ is just on this earth, then we are amongst men the most pitiable. Because someone might be poor and die. You might be wanting to get a baby. I mean, we are not married, right? But for those of us who are married somewhere, I mean, if you have a baby and you are wanting more, you want a boy, you want a girl, and you're not getting it. I know people that have left the church because they got married and they didn't get the baby. They left the church and they went somewhere else because they believe that they will get a baby there. Our hope is not only on this earth. So these three things are very important. Love, faith, and hope. Now, faith comes with works. And see, more money Elisha on his status, he says that Faith is an action word. If you profess to have faith, then we must work. That is what comes with faith. So James discusses in the book of James that faith without works is dead. And throughout the whole discussion, what he was implying was that faith produces works. 
and works make faith complete. So if we have faith in Christ, then basically we are saying that we are working for Christ. So if you don't have faith in Christ, you wouldn't work for Christ. And it's something that you must very, I mean, very, we must take note of. If you don't have faith in Christ, you can't work for him. And if you have faith in Christ and you are not working for Christ, you are deceiving yourself. That is how it is. Or that's what it means. So if you have faith in God, then you have to work for God. Because faith comes with works. So if you have faith in God, you understand what God is saying, but you are not working. Then there is a problem. We are called by the gospel into the fold of Christ. True. We are not called to come here into the kingdom as spectators. No. We are called to come in here as partakers to do something. So we don't, God doesn't just call us to come into the church. Then we are idle. No. He calls us here. We come, we read his word, we understand, and we are moved by the word to work. That shows that we have faith. And that is why the Hebrew writer said that without faith, it is what? Impossible to what? To please God. Basically saying that without works, it is impossible to please God. The just shall live by faith. Without works, it is impossible to please God. That is basically what the Hebrew writer was saying. Because if you consider the giants of faith or the heroes of faith that he listed and was talking about. These people are people who worked. And so when you read, you would realize that at some point, he would just say, so these people were justified by their works. By their works. And it was accounted to them as they had faith. So we need to have faith. And faith produces works. So if you have faith as Christians and it is not producing any work, then there is a problem. It is the substance of the things we hope for and the evidence of things not yet seen. That is basically faith. And that is what we read in the Bible. So we read the Bible. We believe that there is heaven, but who has seen heaven? We believe that there are a lot of things, but none of us have seen them, right? But we believe that they, there is heaven. And because there is heaven, it must produce a work in us. We have to work to get there. So if you just say that I have faith that there is heaven, then you are not working. Then your faith is dead. That is what James is saying. So if you are saying that you have faith that there is heaven, then that word or that message alone should produce something. Because you we saying that we have faith that there is heaven doesn't mean that we should just sit idle. There is heaven. So we are just sitting. No. There is heaven because heaven is prepared for those who work for God, those who work the works of righteousness, heaven is there for those people. So if you believe that there is heaven, then that concept should produce works for us to do. So it behooves each and every Christian here to work. I mean, we come to the kingdom, Christ is the king, we are the servant, and the servants are expected to work. I don't think that you go to any kingdom, then there are servants in the kingdom, then um, a particular servant is somewhere not working. Idleness. It's a no. God called us to this church to work. If you profess that we have faith in God, then we must work. In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, we read of the talent, the parable of the talent. Then God, um, the parable came like the master gave some of the servants to some he gave 10, to some he gave 5, and to the other he gave 1. The one who had the 5 went to work and he had an additional 5. The one who had the 1 was afraid. He didn't do anything. He buried the talent. The master came. He took up the talent. Then he gave to the master. Do you remember what the master told the servant? The Bible reader, please read with me Matthew chapter 25. Verse number 28. Verse 28. Mm -hmm. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Mm -hmm. Verse 29. Mm -hmm. For to everyone who has more, 
will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 30. Verse 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into the kingdom of darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And cast the underlined word, unprofitable servant. And we know what the servant did for him to be qualified as an unprofitable servant. The man or the servant was idle. The servant was not working. He was just there. He was afraid of the master, so he buried the talent. God expects each and every one of us here to be profitable in the kingdom. So we should just look deep down within ourselves and ask ourselves, what have I done for God ever since I became a Christian? What have you done for God? Are you an agent of righteousness? God expects each and every one to be profitable in the kingdom. And those who are unprofitable, they will just receive the same punishment just as they say and did. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you are unprofitable in the kingdom, God will send us to the outer darkness. So we should ask ourselves, ever since we became a Christian, how profitable have you been? How profitable have I been? How profitable have we been as Christians? Because God is going to ask us, what did you do for me? You know, it's different when I say that, okay, I'm a Christian. I don't fornicate. I don't bet. I don't gossip. You see, when you sit down to analyze these things, when you don't do these things, it's just for your own benefit. It's not for God. We try better and like nyanko pon and kano baso uko cha ubebu aten like he will judge you for it. But if you don't, I mean, if you don't bet, it's for your own good. But we are not talking about that. That is for you. You are living for yourself. But are you living for God? What are you doing for God? That is the main thing that we should look at. Are you living for God? So you don't do all these things. You don't. I mean, you are so much particular about not committing any sin, but are you thinking about what you must do for God? Today is Act 7 challenge. Tomorrow it might not be that. But you are talking about individual things that you must do. The church will organize it, but the church doesn't organize Act 7 every day. So what are you going to do when the church doesn't organize Act 7 challenge? What are you going to do when the church doesn't organize Joseph's project? There are three main roles or responsibilities of the church. To evangelize, to edify, and to be benevolent towards our, ourselves and those outside. That also means that as Christians, it behooves each and every one of us to do these acts. So we don't wait for the church to do it before we go ahead to also do the same. It is your responsibility to evangelize. Now in the church we provide the avenue. And it's sad that when the church even provides the avenue, some of us don't even go. We don't show up. Now, today is Acts 7 Challenge. We are going out there to preach. I know some of us, after just here, we just go out and we go to our hostels. You are unprofitable. You have to be profitable in the kingdom. If you profess that you have faith in Christ, it must produce works. Because the just shall live by faith, and without faith, it is impossible. So if you are not working, it is impossible for you to please God. It is impossible. You know, Ezra, Ezra's uh, prayer in Acts 7, sorry, Exodus chapter 7, verse 10. For Ezra had prepared in his own heart to seek the things of God. Not only that, to do it for himself. So he thought about himself to do it, and it didn't end there. He had to do something, so he also understood that he had to teach the ordinances of God. So, he had prepared his own heart to seek God. One, we need to have the willingness to do something. It doesn't end there. We have to do it ourselves. Miami day was why It doesn't end there. We are not living for ourselves as Christians. No. We are living for God. So, when you do something, you go out there, then you preach to people. It's only about preaching. It can come in giving. 
It can come in a lot of things. The works that we can do in the church are many. I remember one time when I was on campus, we visited one lady and it was like, Taste of Christ, we suppressed the potentials of ladies. I was like, really? It is just about distinguishing rules. Bible, na na can. For the males or the gents, we are supposed to do this. Ladies, you are supposed to do something else. Focus on what you are supposed to do as a lady, as a gent. There are a lot of things that you can do. A lot of avenues that you can show up to help broadcast the word of God, to help and become each other's keeper, to help so that we can edify ourselves as Christians. I mean, that is our sole purpose. And it's sad that you can see someone come to campus and the person will just behave as if he or she is not a Christian. It is very sad because as human beings, eh, we like we have an objective purpose to serve God, to worship God, to do something for God. Because when you die, when you die, you are not taking anything. But there is one thing that we take with us: the works that we did here on earth. For that, it will follow you. That works, it will follow you, and it is based on those works that God will judge you. It is impossible. For anyone to please the Father without works. So if you profess to be a Christian, if you profess to have faith, then you have to work. It must produce something in you. You have to work for God. You might do it for yourself, but it shouldn't end there. You need to work for God. When you consider the stuff that are happening outside, like in TRC anymore, it's serious. And if he doesn't prick you, like in Kamu as a Christian, then there's a problem. Because that's what you are called in for. You are called in to defend God. You are called in here to do something for God. Now you see people out there and you feel so much like unconcerned. You are not perturbed. Like in Fao, then you are okay. We come to church on Sunday. That is all. No, Christianity is not just about coming to church on Sunday. I believe that. It is the least thing to even do for God. I'm not saying it's important. It's not important. It is. But just to come here on Sunday and that is all. Come on. Like it's the least thing. There are a lot of things that we need to do for God. Who about sorry? You preach. We edify ourselves. We take the Lord's Supper. That is for you. What about you doing something for God? We are called in here to work. It is the business of God. We are partakers of God's business. In 1 Corinthians, think chapter 12, when Paul was discussing the spiritual gifts and he was advising them or providing a solution and one he was saying that we shouldn't, I mean the body is one, but the members are many. The hand cannot say to the head, I'm not the body, so I wouldn't do something. You see, all the parts of the body are there for a purpose. All the parts of the body are there for a purpose. It means that each and every one here has a purpose to fulfill. It means that each and every one here is eligible to work for God. Because just as Paul discusses in the book of Corinthians, the body is there. The church is the body, we all believe. But the church, I mean, when you bring it to the fiscal aspect, just as Paul was discussing, we have the head, we have the hand, we have the leg. These things are there for a purpose. So it is very difficult to, for me to believe that no one is here for a purpose, no one is here to work. We just have to come to church on Sunday, just become ideal, go back on Sunday, you come. Even on weekdays, we don't come. It is very difficult. You come here like a whole four years, six years, Devotion, you are not able to go. Don't broadcast, you are not able to go. Weekdays, you are not able to come. On Sundays, time will open. Now, I mean, I just, today, I want us to analyze it and tell ourselves that it is something that we need to take, like, really, really serious. God will ask us. When you get there, God will ask you, what did you do for him? Yes, you don't fornicate, that is good. Like, it is good. God commends you for that. But what are you doing for God? 
Christianity is all based on sacrifice. It's true. Like your schedules might not permit you and all that. But you have to sacrifice. Jesus Christ had to sacrifice. That is the benchmark of Christianity. So if you're not able to sacrifice, to take your time to do something for God, then there is a problem. Like I was saying, we are students. There is nobody here in Kenya University that applied just because he was a Christian or she was a Christian. And I, during, when you were applying for Kenya University, you just applied as, oh, me a Christian in Timon family. That'd be, we came here as students, but it doesn't derail the purpose of our lives as Christians. No. That objective principle is for us to please the Father. And that is by faith. And that implies we work. So you are a student. That is good. You have to make sure that you make the ace. I mean, if you don't make it, your parents will be disappointed. But what shall it profit you? You make it, but you don't make heaven. You have to make it and make heaven as well. You have to make it and please the Father as well. Me, me, who be that say, will be abwanya me juma pa. Then God is not taking care of that person. God will be there for each and every one. But you have to be there for him first. You have to be there for God first. So we should just ask ourselves, what are you doing? What am I doing? What are we doing? If you take the duties of the church out, can you individually as a Christian do something for God? We are the light, the salt, and the fragrance of Christ. It's not an easy task. No, it's not an easy. When if I was presenting, he said, like we being here, we have about 0.6% of the entire school. And you are identified as the light of the whole school. Maybe in your class, you are the only member that you are identified as the fragrance of Christ in that class. We are sure say, uncle for no, your your classmates or your course mates or what say on Pampa, you know, like they, they can feel or they can see and realize that we can identify this person as the fragrance in our class, as the light in our class, as the salt in our class. It's not an easy task. And that is why you must embrace it and act upon it each and every time to work. That is our identity. That is what God has given us. You are the light. And it becomes so difficult. I mean, Someone wakes up at six thirty and posts memes about twenty on his status. Her status. Then you comment, "Why? Please allow me. If not, put data for me. It is true. I can't buy the data for you, but I can tell you that you have to work for God. And you feel so unconcerned. I mean, these are avenues that we should actually push the agenda. Social media is there. Push the agenda. Ukraine was now over a flyer. No, Obinia here just forward it." And you wouldn't, but you post the memes. I'm not saying don't post memes. I mean, post it. Maybe persuade. Sometimes I have to just go to X, look at them, laugh. But it doesn't derail my purpose as a Christian, my identity as a Christian. No. You can argue about that, about memes. You can argue about it. Trust me, there is a problem. I know a lot of people who post memes and I've never seen them post a flyer that Kane USD has shared. I mean, myself, Philemon, and Lydia, we do a program about contradictions. Moon post ticket, just read post for someone to read, someone to just read it, understand, ask questions. I mean, we are building ourselves in the faith to get there. And you are so much concerned about memes. And the Amy Yane says, some of the memes, if you have realized, they contradict the word of God. And you comment, and the Christian will tell you it's just for fun. It's just for fun. Mr. Utabel said something. Do not, for the sake of having fun, forget that you are the light of the world. Remember, have fun, but don't let it preclude the possibility of letting the world know that you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the world. You are the fragrance of Christ. I'm not saying have, don't have fun. Have it. I mean, do whatever you want to do. Just like Solomon was saying. Like, do everything. 
But in nature, no, your works will do my body with you. And when you get there, Jesus, God, everybody will ask you. The angels will even ask you, what did you do for God? And I don't know what you will say, but they will ask you. So, let's not say to ourselves that, oh, maybe they mean to me in cancer and panel. Maybe they mean to me in yesi. Maybe they mean to me in yesi. I believe that statement is a lie, like, honestly. Regardless of who you are, Moses, he did it. Oh, unless maybe you are like you are deaf and dumb, right? I'm not going to my sign language, me boy. They do, me boy. Yes, I, I, it's it's very difficult. Mean to mean, I I can't believe that. Trust me, that nanko pompa afro by the gospel to the fold of God, and you are saying that me they mean to mean can't say panel. Why is there a form line in the Bible for us to preach the preach the word? No. I remember in, I think, First Peter, say, if you have tasted that the Lord is good, don't let anything hesitate to you. Just go forward. Just, just tell somebody something. And that is why you don't even have to speak, right? You can just post the flyer on the status. You can just help the brethren share something about God. It is an avenue for you to do that. But we forget, and we are having fun. Like, you are having fun. You are... Christians and you're having fun. We are entangling ourselves with those people out there. We are having fun. I mean, let's let our identity be seen out there. Let them recognize us as people of God. We are the church of Christ. It's not easy to be here. If you count it easy, I, I don't know how you are doing it, but it is not easy. At all, it is never easy. And you have to do it each and every time. You have to practice it. It's an everyday thing. Every time when you wake up, every time you go to work, you go to class, wherever you find yourself, they have to see the light. That is why the light is there. I mean, the light is showing. So, it is there for us to see. You as a light, we are to see you. And seeing you must come with works. So, if you are there and you don't work, there is a problem. You must justify your inclusion by working for God. If you don't, you can't pass. You can't pass. It is going to be difficult for us to pass if we don't justify ourselves by works, just like the heroes of faith did. Noah did something. Abraham did something. Sarah did something. These people did something. And they were accounted, it was accounted to them as faith. We read them in the Bible, and the Bible tells us that it is impossible for someone to please the Father without faith. Without works, it is impossible. So if you are here today, we are going for door to door. I don't know the reason that you came with. But let the sacrifice of God convict you to go with us. We want to, I remember, is a report or something? I went to Bridget. She's completed. And we preached the message to the guy. I mean, the guy has believed you we were almost praying our last prayer to leave. And the guy was like, ah. I think we were talking about the fact that the Bible mentioned that ladies are not supposed to have authority over the men in the church. And <laughs> the guy was like, ah. He mentioned one lady's name. He's, he's, she's very popular. I mean, oh yeah, American. Is it Catherine? Is, is there a popular... Catherine Kuman or a minister on good. And Osori was like, so are you trying to say that Catherine Kuman doesn't know this? Into Obeko Bunsam Jimwana. When he said that, I was worried. Do you know what he did? He was like, I can't understand. No, then say Bona Jimusi. That time I couldn't talk, honestly. If you know me, I'm I'm from Pentecost. Because these are people that people look up to and they are stumbling blocks to people. Like, if not for that Catherine Coleman, that guy would have believed the message. But there, he raised that question. I couldn't talk, so Bridget had to keep on explaining. When we were done, we had to leave. Like, honestly. We need to do something for God. And evangelism is one of them. The whole week is for us to go and preach. Don't count yourself out. 
It's a good opportunity. Don't count yourself out. We have the truth. You have to believe it. You have to understand it so that you can love God, so that you can hope that there is heaven for you to have the faith in God to work. The truth is here, unless you don't believe. But if you do, it must produce something. You must work. Possibly you are here and you are not baptized. Yeah, just like the brethren we're seeing, there are a lot of people who come here each and every Sunday. Then they are not baptized. They come, they leave. It's 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 something normal. Even our local congregations, we see them. But I see sometimes I don't know, but it's possible. I believe that we count the sacrifice as Christ some um, like a little thing, like a win here. But when we read Romans chapter five, normally we read the verse eight, but when we start from verse seven, and Paul says that. For scarcely a righteous man one will die. A bad day in Christ say, Obia, no one say cry, obi be wamano. Yet perhaps a good man, one will even dare to die. A bad day in Christ say, Obia, you're good. Cry, obi be wu. But God demonstrates his love to us in that while we were still sinners. You know, I love it when Paul, I love the book of Romans. John said it simple, right? When he said that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, right? But have everlasting life. But Paul comes in and will be like, but God demonstrated his love. Paul is telling us how hard it was for Christ to do it. He's telling us how huge a sacrifice it was. It's very important for us to give our lives to Christ and to work for him. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, the parable of the wedding feast I'm ending in Matthew chapter 22. The king sent his people to go out there and bring I mean, the wedding were for some people. And those people, they didn't come. And the second time, they even killed the messengers. The third time, and you are privileged to be here today. But we came in here and we've not put on Christ. And so the master said to one of the servants, how did you come here without a garment? In other words, it's impossible for you to get to heaven without Christ. Because we say that with baptism, we put on Christ. So how is it possible? It's impossible. How, how is it possible that you can get to heaven when you haven't put on Christ? So the master said to the servant, how did you get in here without a garment? How did you get in here without Christ? How did you get in here? You're coming to church every Sunday without Christ. It is impossible. You can't get to heaven without, I mean, with that. With that. You have to put on that garment. You have to get baptized and put on Christ. And you have to work for Christ. Like I said, today is Acts 7 challenge, but tomorrow it wouldn't be that. Consider yourself as a Christian, someone who wants to please God and do something for God. Do something for God. For Ezra had prepared in his heart to see God, to do something, I mean to do it for himself and to teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. He understood that he ought to do something for God. No one here should be idle in the kingdom of God. We all have to do something for God. And God expects all of us to do it. For, for the fact that you are being called by the gospel, it is your responsibility. It is my responsibility. And it is our responsibility to please the Father. Thank you very much and God bless us all. Amen.